Oh, hi, everybody. Yay, look at this panel. All right, so I'm, uh, you know, all about the good news. We have uh, a unique opportunity that I never thought I would see as a longtime activist uh, where, where we're deemed an essential service. And, you know, this crisis is really terrible. And I, I've, been, I've been alone in my house forever and it really, really sucks. And I'm so scared for the world, but we do what we can do. And what we can do is uh, we can bring a be this beautiful plant to even more people because um, you know uh, we can we can move the ball, push the envelope. Let's push the envelope. And I'm so grateful to John Schroyer and his uh, hard work and his love for the cannabis plant as well. Um, and I would like to turn this panel over to his capable hands. Thanks for uh, thanks for having all of us, Susan. I appreciate it. Um, I, uh, just before, uh, before I get started, I wanted to mention to all the listeners, basically, uh, Senator Nancy Skinner, unfortunately, is only going to be able to be with us for about 20 minutes. Um, so really, uh, wanted to start off with her and, and then, uh, get, get a lot of the rest of the panel involved. Um, but, uh, so Senator Skinner, since you have to, uh, run in, in a, in a short time frame, uh, I wanted to kind of just give you the floor and, and see if there's anything in particular that, that you think uh, the legislature could do or that the state government could do that it's not already doing uh, to support the cannabis industry uh, just while the coronavirus is ongoing, especially because the industry is uh, considered essential and, um, and, and there have been a lot of uh, added costs to, uh, to doing business um, for a lot of operators that I've been hearing about. So do you have any thoughts on what the legislature or the state could do in addition, I guess? Certainly, glad to join you. Um, thanks for hosting this. I was really happy to see, as Susan pointed out, that the governor included cannabis in the essential businesses. I think that was a little bit of a struggle initially. Um, the Bay Area counties were uh, kind of uh, waffly for their bit, um, but uh, that was secured. And then um, I was surprised to see in my own district, the city of Berkeley was going to require all the cannabis industries to be delivery only, which of course, if you're not set up for delivery only, that would add huge costs. And I thought that was highly ironic given that our liquor stores were open. So uh, I you know, spoke to the mayor and uh, some other city staff that uh, just the absurdity of that policy when they quickly reversed themselves. So that was a, a good thing. Um, in the meantime, uh, you know, sales are down. Um, it, it's, uh, I'm kind of a little bit surprised. I thought they would be up a bit given that alcohol sales are up, but it may be just, um, again, that difficulty of access. We still have so many communities that don't have uh, retail facilities and thus people have to go a lot farther to get a product. Um, uh, so I think the state, I, I've always been in favor. I know it's in the initiative to allow the local control, but I feel like we've we are seen that there's a bunch of um, local localities that are just not willing. And I think that that really needs to be re-looked at, this, uh, this putting of um, complete local control. Because uh, as we know around so many issues, whether it's housing, affordable housing, so many things, uh, there's many localities that just refuse. So uh, that isn't really good for the population as a whole. Um, additionally, the uh, tax increase, I was not happy to see. And I know that it, you know every sector in the economy is hurt from this pandemic, cannabis also, and we certainly do not want to uh, have a situation where the gains we've made get reversed or that we lose all small or independent operators and it, there's a consolidation only by uh, you know, huge, well-capitalized operators. That would not necessarily be beneficial e either, especially given our commitment to the equity space and uh, yeah, the equity space. So I think that um, as other uh, legislators have looked at, uh, Assemblymember Bonta, for example, and others to try to provide some kind of tax relief is worth it. Now, I say that when we are facing a $54 billion deficit over the next, um, you know, at least 18 month period, 
and which is quite scary. Uh, hopefully there'll be some more federal injection of funds. Uh, that's not a guarantee, but um, uh, we certainly hope so, which will give us a little more relief. I mean, I still have um, PTSD from, I got elected right at the point where the uh, economy fell apart in the last recession. I took office in December of 2008. I had to immediately start slashing the budget. We faced 60 billion in budget cuts. Now then we didn't have a rainy day fund, at least now we have that. But this whole issue of when the economy is gonna be able to really start you know, putting into the state's coffers is really hard to predict right now. So um, as much as I want tax relief, I think we have to be really creative about what we ask for, just given what the state's revenue picture is. So I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, no, I absolutely appreciate that. That's uh, all, all good info. Is um, I just wanted to be clear though. Uh, is um, do you have any knowledge or of you know any any bills at the uh, at the state capitol in the, in the next few weeks or or month roughly that uh, may uh, give cannabis companies any any relief during uh, during the coronavirus or is that still yet really very much up in the air? Well, I don't know of any particular bills, but I know that we've had members who have uh, been interested in, in um, been and in working with the industry in the past. And I'm uh, well. I haven't asked them directly. I'm assuming that they might be interacting with the administration because obviously uh, Newsom's administration is looking at variety of relief um, to a lot of uh, different sectors. So um, I would hope that those members who've taken the lead in the past are having those conversations. Yeah, okay. Um, so now uh, I'd really like to pivot to uh, Nicole Elliott, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom's uh, cannabis czar, so to speak. Uh, she has a lengthier formal title, but that's the, uh, that's the much easier one for, uh, for everyone to remember. Um, Nicole, I was hoping that you would be able to uh, give, give listeners here today uh, something of a rundown about what, the, uh, what resources are available to uh, cannabis companies from the state of California. Because I, uh, oh. <laughs> That's her. I, I know you're, I know you're, yes, you're, you're dealing, dealing with a five month old, yes. Um, let, the, let, the, let the rest of everybody else know that uh, Nicole's uh, taking care of her, her young one as well today. I'm solo so. parenting right now, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. Um, but the, uh, th there are some steps that have been taken by the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, uh, the, the Franchise Tax Board, um, and, and at least one other agency. But there, there have also been uh, a lot of stories that I've heard, for example, of uh, cannabis companies being denied by the, uh, the CalCap program um, when they would been trying, trying to obtain, uh, you know, business loans, that, that sort of thing. So can you talk at all about, you know, what sort of resources are available to financially support cannabis companies during uh, the pandemic? Sure. So I think you, you uh, and I apologize for any background noise this little lady may create in advance. Um, but basically, I think you, you sort of ran through a couple of the things that the state uh, has done. So you, you've seen um, some work from CDTFA, for instance, uh, on that 90-day uh, tax filing extension. Um, you've seen uh, extensions for taxpayers to file a claim for refund or for any refund that must otherwise be filed by July 31st. This was in the executive order from March 30th, as well as a 60-day extension for requesting a tax appeal with the Office of Tax Appeals. And you saw the sales and use tax deferral program, which applies to businesses um, with under $5 million in annual taxable sales. And we feel really confident that that actually applies to a significant portion of our retail side. One second. Um, so with CDTFA in particular, um, they've been uh, an excellent resource for, for broadly across the, uh, across the board industry in providing relief within the framework that we have been given, right? So really trying to free up cash uh, now and in the coming months. Uh, so that's positive. Um, beyond that, I think there's a couple of other things that the state's really been trying to do. Uh, again, working within our means, but um, trying to provide some regulatory relief through our licensing programs. So you have seen requests for things like curbside delivery, for instance. 
and um, those agencies or those programs have the ability to do some, some regulatory relief under the uh, governor's emergency order. So really trying to be creative in that space where appropriate um, and so long as there's a, a COVID nexus. Um, and so I encourage you guys to, to work with your programs to see if there's additional areas of relief. Sorry. Um, with that though, uh, you know, I know that there have been a lot of stakeholder letters that we've received that have suggested additional areas of relief. Those are things that we're running down um, and vetting. Uh, it takes a significant amount of internal uh, stakeholder agreement from Department of Finance, uh, legal and others uh, to get approval on, on some of those things. So I think what I would say is keep those ideas coming. You guys are an incredibly creative um, bunch of people who you know are quite savvy when it comes to figuring out methods of um, assistance and resources. So I definitely welcome those and I hope to have um, some good news in the coming days uh, and months ahead. Uh, as we work through many of those proposals. So with that said, I would, you know, I, I know that there's a broader sort of overarching um, desire to see direct capital invested into this industry. You mentioned CalCap. Um, we also have a, a program over at GoBiz with the Small Business Finance Center. I think what we run into with those programs is, um, you know, the, the lending issue with traditional financial institutions. And a lot of them are just simply not willing to take on, you know, the legal and regulatory risk. Um, so those are loan loss reserve programs um, or loan guarantee programs. And if there are no loans going out, then those those entities are not able to, to back those loans. So um, that's proven to be, I think, quite challenging for the industry and for ancillary businesses that aren't you don't have SBA funding available to them. And so we're we're working through, you know, options absent that resource um, utilizing you know the funds that we have available to us but it's uh it's you know challenging in an economic time where we to the senator's point have a multi tens of billions of dollar budget deficit um and we've been told that not only are is there very little um likelihood that we'll stand up new programs but we have to solve for um, the lack of funding for existing programs so it's going to be a, a challenging discussion and I, uh, just to expand a little bit on, uh, on that, Nicole, because I've been hearing a lot from operators who have been really hoping to get some kind of um, immediate financial help um, to, to pay for various different added costs that they've had to deal with, um, as opposed to, for example, um, late tax payments, which, which you know, people are not ungrateful for. Um, but there's a big difference between that and as opposed to, you know, a, a quick emergency business yep. loan. Um, I is there are there any programs right now through the state or uh, that, that capital right away? Um, I mean, because I know, for instance, the governor announced a uh, you know micro bridge loan program. Um, uh, so I would say that if you can find a traditional lender to provide you with a, a loan, then then there is a possibility there. It's that it's that. It's that sort of actual moment and deficiency in the, you know, access conversation that proves to be the, the largest challenge. So yes, you know, the, this, I think you're talking about the um, disaster relief loan guarantee program. That's what I was referring to with the Small Business Finance Center. And then as we have that conversation about have those dollars been completely drawn down, um, there's obviously a significant amount of need. There was a significant amount of um, businesses in the state of California that weren't allowed to uh, continue to operate under the, the stay-at-home order. And so um, those those dollars are in high demand and are being drawn down quickly. And so an, a second infusion of cash um, is a discussion that, that happens in the context of a $54 billion deficit. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's challenging. So I would say, I think the Senator mentioned this too, it's, um, it's really working within, been getting creative with the dollars that we have and um, the structures that we have available to us. And we're just going to have to really figure out how to maximize that cre creativity in this really challenging economic climate, which appears to not be going away anytime in the future. I understand. Um, I'd like to pivot a little bit just to some of the rest of our panelists. I want to get the rest of you involved in the conversation as well. And Senator Skinner, I know you're uh, short on time. So if you have anything that you want to jump in on and, and 
comment on, please, by all means, um, do so. But uh, Cody Sanchez from Ansaraj Effect Capital, Omar Figueroa, an uh, attorney from Sebastopol, and Dustin Moore, partner at Axiom Advisors, we also have on the panel. Um, the, do any of you the only have- thing, The only thing I would add before I have to jump off is um, uh, if there's non-monetary type of relief, meaning regulatory, I guess when we were talking creative, uh, either regulatory type relief or, I mean, again, that creative notion of, or is there, is there a, a minimal tweak to say the, uh, the disaster loan funds that it, the state has tried to make available to those entities that are not federally eligible, which obviously our cannabis industry is. And I know that it, while I think it was well designed, the cannabis industry faces uh, specific or particular obstacles because of uh, some of the banking, just the problems with banking relationships. And so if there were any types of uh, tweaks that would make that more accessible or that kind of thing, those would be the kind of uh, suggestions that the legislature and I'm sure the administration would welcome right now. Actually, Senator, before you have to leave, one really quick question, um, and this is sort of one for Nicole as well, but uh, one of the things that I've been hearing uh, in talking to operators that they've been hoping to see is, for example, um, uh, license renewal extensions from ah, your, yes. okay. your pay, okay. uh, from public health and, and extensions on, on uh, license fee payments, for example. Um, is, is that something that you think is, is doable? Because that's something that those three agencies have not yet adopted on their own. Um, and I'm not sure even what it would take, uh, maybe some direction from the governor or, uh, you know, some push by, by legislators like yourself. What do you think about that? Well, we'd have to see what kind of drop in revenue the uh, fee payment relief would cause. The extensions, now that is not, that would not be unusual when you look at how many other extensions we've, um, the governor has now been granting through various executive orders and I'm guessing I don't know exactly what, but the legislature will probably in some trailer bills be allowing other types of extensions. I mean, for example, people's driver's license right now, you don't have to worry about them expiring for a certain period of time. There's lots of extensions that we've been giving sort of across the board. So it might be something that we uh, could do. And uh, I think, you know, exploring with Nicole what openness there is from the administration and then obviously some of us in the legislature can you if you come up with specific ideas besides this and we can uh, talk to our colleagues and see what we can push yeah and i just want to yeah i want to just build off the senator's comments um she's absolutely correct it's a, a multi-million dollar uh liability to talk about waivers and deferrals uh for our licensing programs and uh, we, we're working with a finite, finite set of resources, so um, there's a lot of scrutiny being placed on proposals such as that, um, as I think I indicated in my earlier comments. And so do know that we are uh, running those down and providing that scrutiny to try and come, come out with, a, um, with something that can provide relief to the industry. So it's not falling on deaf ears. It just uh, requires a significant amount of work to run the traps on this. Okay, um, I'd like to pivot to some of our other panelists uh, to get to get the rest of you involved in the conversation, um, because I, I I know several of you probably have thoughts about you know what more in addition the state could possibly do uh, to support the cannabis industry in these times. So um, uh, let's start with uh, Omar Figueroa because I know he's probably got some thoughts on this. Um, Omar, what would you like to? Do you have any thoughts on what you'd like to see the state do to help support cannabis companies, uh, perhaps a little bit more? Absolutely. I think what cannabis operators keep asking the state is something that would have um, a big price tag and would be expensive and needs to be studied right away, and that's maybe suspending the cultivation tax for cultivators and possibly the excise tax for medical patients. But the cultivators are the ones who have been hardest hit. And I think, you know, uh, California is now embarking on an Appalachians program. Yesterday was the public comment on Appalachians and it's the wor world's first cannabis Appalachians. And there's a lot of excitement from all these artisan cultivators who've been hanging on by a thread. And they're the ones who I think are the ones who, um, you know, would benefit the most and could do the most with whatever meager, tax uh, benefits are offered, they should be offered first to 
the cultivators. And I think maybe deferring payment of the cultivation tax, you know, just like everything else is kind of being suspended um, or not suspended, but maybe extended is the proper term, but offering more extensions and, and more generous extensions uh, would be a good place to start. And I don't want, you know, I want to listen to what the other panelists have to say. So. Cody or Dustin, you want to, you want to jump in at the moment? Uh, any, any thoughts on what the, uh, what you think the state could, uh, could do on top of what it's, uh, what it's done so far? Sure. Well, I definitely agree with Omar. Um, the other thing I think is, you know, there are also some pretty hefty taxes at the hyper local level in California yeah. on a city specific basis, yeah. um, which are, you know, hugely vary. Um, and so I think, you know, for these counties and states that say that they are cannabis um, supporters, it would really help if on a, um, you know, statewide level, there was pressure on individual counties that were either sort of trying to shut down these individual businesses or charging, you know, a 10% uh, tax on top of what is already there statewide and federal. Um, th the other thing I think, and somebody actually mentioned it in one of the comments I saw as well, is considering um, drive-throughs and um, increased allowances for some of the companies that are um, already open. You know, one of the biggest issues, I think, to the senator's point was um, access is still tough for a lot of people. And so um, if we could do more things like not just delivery, but drive through, which means they don't have to pay delivery fees as well for you know, individuals that can't afford to do that, I think that would be super helpful. Um, I think the overall goal for us is, is, you know, it really does seem to prove economically that as you increase the number of businesses that are out there, you can decrease the taxes inherent on them. And so, um, you know, it's, it's just math allowing for additional licenses and allowing for more people to share the load, as opposed to continuing to think with a $54 billion deficit, we have to reap as many taxes as we usually can, which actually just ends up throttling an industry and putting people out of business, therefore less taxes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with um, what what Cody was starting with around. This isn't just a state level issue. This is a this is a state level issue. It's a local government issue, and there's kind of a third sphere, which is just situational. I mean, we think about moving forward, what's going to happen with the economy. Thinking about about uh, the commercial uh, real estate market starting to crater may present opportunities for for operators to potentially uh, renegotiate some of their lease terms, whatever it may be, um, to drive down some of those costs. Thinking again, local governments, you know, trying to get them to lessen their taxes. I think it's going to be a similar issue uh, with the state, you know, facing a $54 billion deficit. Well, local governments are, are facing, you know, a $7 billion plus deficit. So, you know, the notion of, of tax relief, I'm a big fan of. I think in the immediate term, um, you know, if there's a way to reconcile the cost benefit for deferring some of these fees at the state level, thinking about, you know, the smaller farmers first, to Omar's point. I think that some of the artisanal farmers and the craft farmers that have been hanging on have been really presented with a life raft through Appalachians of Origin and the California Organic Standard. Um, those are going to be great tools. Additionally, I think there's been proposals in the past where it's been contemplated uh, that, that a taxation structure similar to maybe like craft beer, where uh, productions amounts, uh, production amounts are taxed accordingly, so you are providing relief to those who need it most. So I think um, generally the state has offered a number of resources um, already. And I think that, you know, we're, we're all just struggling to figure out what those next steps are, but it's just so helpful to have, um, you know, such a willingness. I mean, we saw Senator Skinner on here and, uh, you know, Nicole coming on and, and this partnership between uh, government and the cannabis industry, I think just taking a step back for a second and thinking about something that was illegal just a few years ago, uh, that's now essential. And here we are, all sitting here talking together. This is this is very encouraging. Absolutely, um, Nicole. Uh, one one or two other questions for you, actually, specifically that uh, I know a couple of uh, our readers were interested in, in running by you. Uh, first, is is there any chance, uh, as far as you know, that, that Governor Newsom might appeal directly to the federal government to ask that cannabis companies be included in future old, future federal relief packages? Uh, the way just because uh, Governor Jared Polis in Colorado uh, chimed in with the federal government on that, is do do you have any idea if uh, Governor Newsom has any plans on that end? Yeah. So. Um... Uh, I was listening to the congressman earlier, and I know he mentioned negotiations. Um, and I know that uh, in Colorado, we saw a letter go out. I would say in um, so far, our current strategy is we're having a lot of conversations behind the scenes. 
um, in Washington, D.C. So um, just because you don't see it in the letter doesn't mean it's not happening. Uh, we are definitely uh, advocating for relief uh, broadly, but also for the industry. Fair enough. And um, one of the other things I know a couple of folks were interested in is uh, any particular reason the cannabis industry doesn't have a member or isn't represented on the uh, um, Tom Steyer Commission that the, uh, that the governor convened recently? Yeah, you know, I've been hearing a lot on that front and, you know, I'm going to, there's a couple of things. One, there are a lot of industries that are not represented on that task force, albeit it is a very big task force. Um, so um, I think in general you have, I know you have individuals actually sitting on the task force who I've worked very closely with. Um, who are aware of um, many of the issues that you guys face. And they're also individuals that I'm feeding um, information to that I'm actually getting from you guys when you're talking about the recovery portion uh, of what it is that, that you guys think should, should be part of the state's recovery for cannabis. Um, to say that those lines of communication are strong, I mean, the governor put out um, guidance today that, that talked a lot about what uh, in, in stage two uh, businesses, what it is that uh, they can, should be doing in order to reopen. Um, that was also, you, you'll see some information in there that came from the industry, right? You guys put in place some great protocols for worker and, and community consumer safety um, and with those same people. So I, I want you guys to definitely know that um, that information is information that is making it to the eyes and ears and minds of people on the task force, but also do not let that stop you from also working directly with individuals you know on that task force, as well as sending that information my way. Um, and uh, Cody, I wanted to pivot to you for just a moment because uh, the whole point of this panel is really to talk about uh, financial relief and what is already available to, uh, you know, at, at least to some extent for cannabis companies. So I was hoping that, because you and I spoke weeks ago about a lot of uh, tax credits that are, that are already available to, to cannabis companies um, at, at both the federal and state level. I was hoping you could uh, give folks just a little bit of a rundown of those, not, not necessarily exhaustive because we don't have a ton of time, but um, talk about maybe some of those and, and, and what, those, uh, what some of those options are. Sure. Um, yeah, I won't put everybody to sleep with the massive paper that we put out on that, um, as fun as tax codes are for everyone to consider. Um, you know, a couple things. Um, one, what's interesting is we're starting to get uh, our first, the, the key there is non-plant touching, so ancillary services, um, companies are starting to get their first measure of relief. And so um, I think that's actually important. We weren't sure that was really going to happen in the industry. And so we're actually, we haven't seen a company actually get dollars in their bank account yet, but we have seen them in the first wave um, of some of the actual um, loans come through, through the SBA. Um, and so I think that's actually positive. Um, we weren't sure that companies would be considered for those. Um, and so, you know, and those loans aren't small. Um, we'll see if these companies actually get their, these exemptions to be continued, meaning that they have loan forgiveness. That, you know, our stance for our portfolio companies is essentially to assume that you will not have your loans forgiven because you want to be on the safe side without a massive um, tax burden. But what's, what's interesting that we've read throughout is, you know, there are essentially, there are two different segments, right? There are loans for which non-plant touch plant touching companies can actually gain access. And then there are tax credits for which our understanding is that plant touching companies can actually gain access to them as well. If you want a complete breakdown of all of the loans and the tax credits available, John, you wrote a great piece, um, essentially breaking down sort of the, what we consider to be the seven or eight main components. Um, so I would recommend you go and look through that. The one big problem I see overall for the loan segment is if you don't already have your application in by now, I, I'm, not feeling very confident in the fact that you'd actually be able to get any money at this point. Money's pretty much gone. And, um, and I think the waiting list basically is continuous. Um, as far as tax credits, we've been instructing our companies to essentially look through the tax credits just as they would anything else this year. And so we're seeing companies put forward some plans uh, that may just save them over the next 60 days. There are three exemptions in particular that apply to cannabis companies. Again, you can see them on that, um, on that entire breakdown. And um, Dustin and Omar, I want to get you a little bit more both involved in the conversation. I was uh, hoping both of you could weigh in on 
uh, what you're hearing from, from cannabis companies directly about how they're doing in general during the pandemic, uh, particularly without a lot of financial help um, to, to remain afloat. How, how much are a lot of the companies that, you're, that you've heard from, are they, are they hurting and how much are they able to remain operational and just continue doing business as normal? Um, can you just sure. sort of, at least to the you know, general sense of what you're, of how the industry is doing these times? Yeah, I guess I'll start off in California. What we've seen is a lot of uh, regulatory flexibility where uh, many of dispensaries and other types of retailers were allowed to do curbside pickup pretty much right off the bat. And then upon request, they were also allowed to do um, pickup windows or drive-throughs or walk-up windows. Um, so that part of it has been heartening. But there's also some retailers who have invested like, you know, almost small fortunes in their retail experiences. And I'm thinking of a um, dispensary in Santa Rosa, I think it's called Boogie Nights, and they have a, a multi-million dollar retail space, which was supposed to be just wonderful. I never got a chance to visit it. I thought it'd be there forever. And uh, now it's no longer open to the public. Now it's a curbside delivery place. And so, um, I think the small agile operators are the ones who have really thrived. You know, the, I call them the small mammals and then the, the behemoths, you know, are, are kind of like dinosaurs and they're not as quick to be able to adopt a completely different business model, which in California has really pivoted from, um, you know, what used to be a retail experience has now turned into a curbside pickup like the olden days. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with um, Omar across the board. And, and I think that it's really um, case by case and, and where you sit in the value chain. I, you know, I, unfortunately, I think some of the smaller cultivators um, are struggling because many of their distributors are, are struggling, namely because a lot of the retailers like Omar mentioned that were really strictly focused on being brick and mortar only um, have struggled to adapt in this environment. You also have kind of traditional storefront retailers that have have struggled to implement um, delivery protocols and or curbside pickup. So I do believe that some of the smaller companies that are nimble um, are going to come out of this uh, ahead. I also think that this accelerated a natural correction that was already occurring in the market. Yeah. So I think that kind of rise of the cannabis 2.0 operator and, and this influx of Canadian capital, um, I think we're seeing those companies just getting obliterated right now. But again, I, I believe that that was something that was going to happen naturally. So um, I think this presents a, a, a large opportunity for some of the smaller, more nimble operators, as long as um, you know, local governments continue to implement uh, policies that don't allow for that type of consolidation. We're seeing many local governments not allowing for license transfers, et cetera. And that's actually preserving uh, the ability for some of these smaller operators to survive in this time of consolidation. Uh, I'm generally optimistic for folks who can, you know, maintain or cash flow through this, uh, folks who can go back to their investment partners with realistic expectations, appreciating that maybe we're in the second inning of a nine inning game. Um, I think those are all things to keep in mind. This, this will pass. Uh, it's going to be painful, but uh, it will pass. John, there's just one thing that I would add, which is for the first time ever, I've seen uh, external uh, debt lenders come into the industry in just the last three weeks in a way I've never seen previously at lower, um, still not cheap uh, debt, but at lower um, in, uh, interest rates than typical. So actually I had two companies today that were approached with a 10% you know, a, a loan over a 12 and 18 month basis when the industry standard for even some of the big MSOs is more like anywhere from let's call it 13 to 18. And yeah. so one thing I might do if I was a company in this space is not always consider equity. Obviously I'd love you to consider equity, that's what we do. Um, but if you can get access to debt capital, um, you should look for non-traditional sources. You don't have to go to just cannabis funders anymore. There's appear to be some third parties, particularly in the private equity and um, senior secured space that are coming into cannabis for the first time. What are the, uh, Cody, just to follow up on that, out of curiosity, like, are you seeing, like, I mean, loans being made available at a, you know, certain level? Are we talking, like, uh, below six figures, over six figures? 
No, these are, these are going to be for more medium sized businesses. So most of these loans we're talking about million dollar plus loans, right? So oh, these are, awesome. these are for, yeah. If you think about it from the debt perspective, um, if I'm going to go out and write this type of debt, I need to have assets to write it against, um, which probably means you're a relatively sized company and they need to have some sort of collateral. Um, and so, you know, in any other industry, this is very typical in cannabis, we haven't really had access to debt ever. And so, um, so if you, you know, if you were a cannabis company searching for this type of thing, what I would suggest you do is go and look for who are the lenders in, um, your parallel industry. If you're cultivation, that'd be agriculture. If you're retail and brands, that would be retail and brands, not in cannabis and see who the main lenders are in the space and start to have a conversation. Um, the nice thing is if you're super distressed right now, there are trillions of dollars on the sidelines for distressed company players. It's tough as a founder to take distressed capital. That typically means you're going to lose a lot of either you know, equity or negotiation, or you're going to have to give up some terms, um, but you might be able to stay alive. Yeah. I also wanted to ask uh, the three, Cody, Dustin, and Omar, um, and this is sort, sort of a little bit of input question for, for Nicole. I was wondering if um, any of the three of you have any suggestions on kind of low hanging fruit that you think would be uh, easy for the news administration or just the, the state of gov state of California to implement um, that could, you know, just uh, help support cannabis companies during the, during the pandemic. Any, uh, and I, I, and I, I had, you know, kind of license extensions in mind when I was thinking about low hanging fruit. Um, but maybe, maybe the three of you have some other uh, particular ideas. Well, I think all sorts of magic is going to happen in the trailer bill. And so that's when we'll probably see some of these uh, changes happening. Hopefully a cultivation uh, tax being drastically lowered or maybe suspended for a spell, uh, hopefully to stimulate the regulated market. Also, uh, you know, something on the retail side. Um, I mean, I think you know, if the more burdensome it remains for the regulated industry to thrive, the more the so-called um, unregulated, duty-free, traditional black market will thrive. And so I think it's important to keep in mind that California has such an entrenched duty-free market that, you know, these burdensome taxes have outsized effects. And, um, you know, but, you know, I really like, what can we think up that will increase revenues? I think, you know, allowing more operators into the system and that really requires um, freeing up at the local level, more cannabis business licenses. And that could be accomplished by uh, legislation. You know, I don't know if you can tuck it all, all that into a trailer bill, um, which would basically turn, you know, a lot of California into green zones and which would really result in, you know, hundreds or thousands more uh, licensed cannabis businesses, all of whom would pay taxes. And then you could like cut the taxes significantly and still increase revenues. Dustin, you think there's any uh, low hanging fruit to, to be had for uh, the state government and the cannabis industry or um, because I, I know Omar, I get where you're coming from on the, on the tax. But that's not that, low hanging. Yeah. No, it's not that that's, that's, that's a really not, heavy, yeah. that, you know, a lot of people have been working on for, for years now. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, not, not discounting the importance of it or anything, but <laughs> I don't think that's going to be a very easy one for, for the state to implement. Uh, but, um, Dustin, what do you, do you, what do you, what do you think? Is there anything that uh, could be some, something of an easy fix here? Well, I, I think state? first I'd like to acknowledge the state. I think has taken advantage of a number of low hanging fruit. I mean, curbside delivery, contactless delivery. Um, I, I think this, they've been incredibly flexible with, with companies that are, um, you know, are struggling on a case by case basis. I've had clients that have worked directly with the BCC and, and um, you know, have been able to work through their issues. I think it would be great if local governments uh, throughout the state would do the same, because I think the low hanging fruit really is at the local level. And again, um, optimistic that with this uh, major uh, budget deficit at the local level that we'll start to see access open up. I think at the end of the day, the biggest choke point in the entire industry is uh, that between um, the consumer and the retailer. I mean, the, the, we have a robust supply chain in California, but these access point um, constrictions are, are what's really holding the industry back. So I, I'm optimistic that through this process, 
more jurisdictions will come online, not, not just because of COVID generally, but I think that was already the direction um, that uh, things were going. I also think that you know, the proposed consolidation of the agencies is gonna be tremendous uh, for cannabis businesses. Having one point of contact in government is gonna be incredible. Um, so really, really looking forward to that as well. Okay. I think the only thing that I would add is, you know, of, let's say, if we say the cannabis industry has 600 million or something like that in taxes in California in 2019, of that 600 million, there's about anywhere from 60 to $70 million of that that actually goes back some way to help the industry. You know, 15 million or so goes to, to research and I think another 50 some odd goes to, um, goes to license or actually regulating the industry. Um, and there's a small amount, I think, that also goes to stopping black market practices. I think it'd be interesting for um, the legislator to think a little bit more about if we can't change the tax revenue as is, that's a big lift, then can we allocate some of those resources to have a double-edged sword? Could, you know, if, if our big push is on, you know, recidivism rates or on training, you know, and education that you provide in the cannabis uh, from cannabis tax dollars. Could you in some way give that back to the companies? So help training program programs for people to come and be temp workers in the cannabis space because right now cannabis companies have like 30% of their employees not showing up on a daily basis. And so they, there's a huge temp employee shortage. And so I don't know anything about how you could actually regulate that and if that is a heavy lift or not, but it'd be interesting to see a few more of those tax dollars help the community while also helping cannabis as opposed to, you know, less than one sixth of uh, the revenue going to that. Sure. And uh, Nicole, I want to, I want to circle back to, to you. I have uh, plenty, plenty of questions that I would love to run by you uh, pretty much for, I don't know, an hour or longer. Um, but the, I was wondering if there's, since Omar mentioned the, uh, the trailer bill, anything that you can uh, tell listeners today about uh, the, about the trailer bill, what, uh, what could be in that uh, cannabis related? Um, I, I mean, obviously the governor's already, gotten behind the tax simplification process, um, not necessarily tax reduction, but uh, some significant changes there in the merging of the three regulatory bodies that, that Dustin mentioned. Um, but any, any other details that you might be able to share or, or uh, tell, us, uh, tell us about what uh, you know, might be on the table or, or not, really, uh, not really realistic, for example? Uh, so, I mean, you guys know that for, I think, it was made very clear in the early part of this conversation, the state is um, going to have a very uh, challenging, I would say, uh, eight weeks ahead of us in, in working through um, that deficit uh, issue as well as COVID specific matters. Um, so never before have we been faced with um, such a massive shift from a January budget to a May revise and I would say, I think it's fair to say recent history, if not all time. Um, and so uh, that's going, my assumption is that's gonna really impact our conversations um, wholesale across every, every issue, not just cannabis. But, but with that said, those conversations are happening in real time that, that may re revise is being developed um, and finalized as we speak. And so that's not, I'm, I'm not gonna jump the gun on, on any uh, announcements that comes out of May Revise, but more than anything, it's fluid. So I don't have answers at this point as far as that's concerned. Um, so stay tuned. May Revise, I believe, is, is dropping in the very near future. And, and so we will have to reconvene and have some conversations after um, those decisions have been made and all of those issues have been disclosed um, to figure out path forward. Fair enough. Um... Uh, question for pretty much the entire panel, although Nicole, this might be a little bit outside your wheelhouse. I was wondering what uh, what each of you are hearing on uh, the investment front in, in the cannabis industry. This, I mean, this has been an on and off topic for a lot of the rest of the panels today, uh, the state of cannabis. Um, but I mean, for example, in a lot of times in the past, if a you know particular company was going through a rough patch, one obvious solution would be to go hunt down an angel investor or some other private lender for help. And um, Cody, you mentioned that you've seen you know some some resurgence in that in that area. Um, but I, I was hoping to get all of your thoughts on whether or not kind of investor hesitancy is kind of part of this problem that, that we're talking about in terms of just the financial distress uh, for the industry at large amid the pandemic. Well, I think there's definitely investors who are looking for distressed properties and distressed licenses, um, but they're really not buying the hype like they used to, you know, when there was like 
the uh, big shopping spree of cannabis businesses and everybody wanted to become a multi-state operator and they were not really opening the hood and taking a peek under the hood and seeing what kind of engine was underneath. And so I think there's a lot more investor skepticism and you can probably expect um, investors to be excited about distressed properties, which means that they're getting a great value on sound financials, but they're going to be wanting to now probably look at the actual financial performance of the company and not just the novelty of having a cannabis license. Yeah, I mean, um, we're an investor in the space, so I, I would echo everything Omar said. If you're listening and you're a cannabis company, here's a few truths. One, if you have had a valuation set pre-COVID, throw it out the window, you need to go lower. Two, if you had a valuation set pre, you know, June 2019 when the industry, you know, went down, you need to throw it out the window twice. And these are harsh truths, but the problem is, unless you confront the truth, you won't be able to raise capital in this environment. And the longer you wait, the more desperate you're gonna become as your runway burns. Um, you know, there are very few cannabis companies that are actually profitable or have positive EBITDA because we have 280E on top of our industry, plus all these other taxes with like an 80% effective tax rate. So there is no harder industry to do business in than cannabis. So I salute yes. all of you entrepreneurs on the line. Good for you. You were saddling up to battle the dragon. Um, that said, I think you are going to see a lot of investors come into the space over the next six to 12 months. You might not like the terms. The terms are going to be tough overall from investors, but they're going to start coming in. However, the deficit between this industry and any other industry I've ever seen is unprecedented. I have never seen an industry be so liquidity constrained in my entire career, and neither have my partners. They got a little bit more gray hair than I do. Um, and so, um, you know, if you're running out of capital and you're running a business that's requiring more capital infusions in your company, you need to start thinking about which areas you can sell and divest. Um, because if your business right now requires constant capital, that is not going to be the way of the future in the next six to 12 months. You're gonna to have to start moving on a path to profitability. Yeah. Dustin, any uh, thoughts on just uh, investor front and relationship to uh, just the current uh, current crisis? Yeah, no, I think um, Cody uh, picking up uh, where she left off. I think the notion of, you know, specializing in all things is not going to work. I think, you know, finding your true specialization, um, don't be a mile wide and an inch deep. I think that, you know, the notion of vertical integration being the only way to succeed in this industry is going to prove itself wrong over time. Um, I think that you're going to start to see leaders in each vertical in the value chain. Uh, I think that as long as you're being realistic about, you know, your valuation, investors are still interested in investing in good teams um, with financial discipline and a long-term business model. I think that, you know, before we were seeing companies that had, you know, one to two year exit trajectory, and that's not going to be attractive anymore. I think if you have a solid team, a solid, uh, you know, sol solid value offering and a long-term plan, I don't think that, um, you know, the capital is going to be sparse. I think it's just going to look more realistic when compared to traditional industries. And um, one question, be, I, th there's been a lot of talk uh, throughout several of the panels today about, you know, creative out of the box thinking. And, and this is a question that came to me from, from one contact who was uh, trying to brainstorm some sort of way that uh, canvas companies could figure out some kind of financial relief. And, uh, this person suggested that maybe, you know, somehow grants could be provided to local cities or counties that could then, um, then through the local government, uh, distribute uh, financial help uh, in some form to, to legal licensed cannabis companies. Um, any, any chance that any of you think that's even realistic or, or remotely possible or if there are any other types of uh, kind of out of the box solutions for, for getting financial help to, to cannabis companies during this pandemic? I don't know if that was directed at me, but I'm happy to speak to that. Um, if the state is the one giving those grants versus the federal government, um, I, I think it's, it goes back to the challenge that, that the, the governor and the legislature and the Department of Finance is up against around um, developing a balanced budget um, and sort of where those dollars come from. Um, so, so I know that somebody had asked a question about social equity. Um, that's an example, I think, that your, your contact was 
perhaps looking at that framework and thinking, well, there's somewhat, something established, we've seen it work. Um, and that's true. Um, the governor was very um, explicit about that $30 million getting out this year. You saw GOBA's work at lightning speed to do that. Um, so, you know, there, there is some capital the state has put out to local governments um, and we're trying to, um, you know, get those dollars out the door as fast as possible. I would encourage you guys um, in jurisdictions uh, where you see, um, to, to those of you that would be eligible, where you have jurisdictions that did get those grant dollars to advocate to also have those dollars um, be put, you know, put out as fast as possible on the local level. But to this sort of broader question about grants, um, conceptually, it's, it's a great concept. I think you have a, a government that is much more willing to entertain those types of conversations um, now with a governor like Gavin Newsom. Uh, it's just a, it's a challenge of where that capital will actually come from um, with a deficit. And that's what we'll be challenged with. And the only thing I would add is, um, you know, if, if you're a business fighting for survival right now, I probably wouldn't spend too much time advocating for government help. I mean, your best bet is actually to work inside of your business. Yep. And, um, you know, that, that's not to say that, like, you know, thankfully our government is providing help to companies, but it's also because we're in a regulatory induced coma um, that is also, you know, from regulations from the government. And so, and understandably so, given the health risks, I don't think I have to make all the disclaimers here. Everybody understands the situation in front of us. Um, but I would spend much more time thinking about how could you pivot your business? How could you partner with somebody? How could you do M&A inside of your business? How could you do something in an industry, you know, a segment of the industry that is considered essential? Can you partner up with a delivery service? So get creative focusing on what you can control instead of trying to influence the outcome with something that you have very little to no control over. Uh, that would be my two cents. And that, I mean, that, that pretty much, uh, Cody, you kind of answered one of my, one of my final questions, which is going to be uh, best single bit of advice for legal cannabis and companies in California trying to weather the coronavirus while also remaining open for business. Um, anyone else want to uh, want to tackle that? Just single, single best bit of advice for uh, cannabis, legal cannabis companies struggling financially in, in the pandemic? I think survive, you know, uh, it's all about survival now. And there's going to be like a BC before coronavirus. Um, and there's going to be like a, a very few companies that made it through that sieve. And so I think this is kind of like an extinction event, uh, just given the lack of um, banking and liquidity for companies that may need you know extra cash flow and so for that reason i think um you know um probably like you know is it's going to be like focus on the basics um what cody was saying survival requires focus on the basics yeah, yeah and i think picking back up around partnerships um you know and, and figuring out you know partnering with a delivery company if you're a retailer i think finding good supply chain yes. partners and really trying to scale back. Don't try to do everything. Do what you're good at. And I think you're going to see a lot of creative ecosystems and, and um, you know, collectives coming out of this, which, you know, frankly, that's how this industry was, was born for, for some time. So it's kind of reverting back to um, a time before. And I think that that's going to be important that folks can um, you know, think creatively. Yeah, absolutely. One last little nugget too instead of letting go of all your employees immediately, we were pushing our portfolio companies. They, you know, a lot of people panic. They want to cut a huge majority of their staff in order to stop their burn. One thing I might suggest is give your employees a chance. Um, you know, turn things around to be commission oriented, turn things around for mm. people that have an opportunity to actually, you know, earn their pay, defer their pay. Um, we've seen a lot of our companies take this strategy and, you know, it is expensive to have to rehire people again, especially if and when the economy turns. So um, I would I fully understand that at some times you just have to cut. That is absolutely true. Um, but you might try giving your employees an opportunity to actually earn you money as opposed to cutting staff and having to do it all yourself. Sorry, Nicole. Oh, no, that's totally fine. I yeah. Um, I think just just um, on the government side, I would say, uh, and I know this has been a topic of discussion today with you guys, but um, really thinking about how you can coalesce around really meaningful asks of, of state government 
um, and even local government, but just speaking for state government, um, really being judicious and nuanced with those requests um, because sort of that scattershot uh, requests that come in while they're still seen and heard, I think when you know you have uh, a request that you see a broad portion of the industry get behind and you know will be meaningful to that industry. That's, you know, in a time when our energy is going in a million different directions, we want to be able to put our, 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 um, our okay. energy towards those types of things. And uh, we're almost out of time, but we have a few minutes left and I'm uh, pretty much all through all the questions that I had brainstormed for this panel. Um, so I have one last one, unless Susan, are there any like questions from listeners or the audience or anything like that that uh, you might want to throw out? Um, I, I wanted to uh, mention something that doesn't cost the state any money. My, uh, my wish that we could Create for if we could create uh, some some uh, ways that brands and retailers could go. Uh, we could do more B two C. So if we could start mailing product, is there any way that we could? I, I said that to Lou Carrera this morning, and he said, "U.S. Post Office," and I said, "Sure," and he said, "Okay, send me an email." So you know that that would just be a fun win win situation if we could manage that. Using common carriers for delivery would be definitely a regulatory innovation that would be welcomed by many. I mean, I, I was thinking that we're starting to see stuff now like contactless delivery that did not really exist before. And that's opening up possibilities like um, having people like subscribe to a box that they would get like once a, a month that would contain cannabis direct from the farm. And that would provide the direct to consumer model that many in the wine industry have used to compete, like the small wineries have used to compete with like the massive factory wineries that produce box wine. You know, there's also room for the ultra premium artisan producers. And so, um, but the only path forward for these cultivators really, uh, rel you know, it's ultimately going to be direct to consumer sales and building their loyal, um, you know, club members. And so there's a lot of interest now, I think, in having club membership. And, uh, you know, that such an idea is not that difficult to implement from a regulatory perspective. Um, because we already have that for wine. I think for wine right now, what's happening is, um, I think you noticed that, Susan. It's like you, they're not requiring adults to sign. There's no 21 and over signature required for wine. They're just dropping it off at the front door. And so if that can happen for wine, why can't it happen for a substance that is not like that's not going to kill somebody? Like if somebody gets like alcohol, that's a lethal substance that could kill kids. But cannabis is not lethal in that way. Um, and I think that's where we could see some regulatory innovations where there's more businesses and it's, you know, then we're starting to see like a greater, more diverse ecosystem. I actually have one last question for Nicole. I'm just curious uh, what, what your thoughts are on this one. This is something I've spoken to Dustin about uh, previously. Um, there's a, uh, a theory that is starting to float around the cannabis industry that the, um, uh, the coronavirus actually could lead to more cities and counties opening their borders to the legal cannabis companies because in coming months, they're going to be, uh, those cities and counties are going to be, their budgets are going to be hurting. They're going to be looking for jobs, tax revenue, pretty much wherever they can find it. And there's a belief that um, among, among a lot of different folks that I've spoken to that, that that's going to cause a lot of city and county officials to revisit their decisions in, in the past to ban commercial cannabis, uh, commercial cannabis activity. And I'm just curious if you, uh, if, if you think that that might be a trend that could come to pass, if you've heard anything similar to that, um, because I mean, we just saw Anaheim, for example, there are signals there that, uh, that that city might, might start opening up. Um, and, and a few others as well. Um, I'm curious yeah. what you think about that. I mean, I sure hope that's right. We've always been an advocate of uh, seeing more jurisdictions uh, and prohibition and, and partner with the state on a uh, regulatory framework. And, you know, having come from local government, I know that uh, those decisions um, around budget cuts are very, very difficult too. And um, they're even closer to 
um, being boots on the ground. Uh, they, they see where those cuts uh, really hit. And so I do think you, you could see more jurisdictions um, from, a, from a revenue perspective uh, be willing to entertain that discussion. Um, now, how can the state be helpful on that front? I think that's the challenge that we have ahead of us, right, is how we can prove to be good partners to those jurisdictions um, and assist them in standing up those frameworks in a, in a thoughtful way, but in a way that works uh, for the operators that are likely in that jurisdiction, as well as uh, new operators that come into that jurisdiction. So I think that's our challenge uh, to really embrace. But yes, I do think there is something to that point. And I, I think our time's up, Susan, My unless I'm wrong. No, you're right. You're very correct. Thank you so much. You did a great job, John. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, John. Uh, we could go on for hours and let's do, let's first Thursday of next month, let's keep going. Uh, you don't have to log off. I'm going to demote you to an attendee if you want to stay and hear uh, what Rob Bonta has to say. I, if you don't know David Bienenstock, he is so great. He's a longtime activist and he uh, always finds a way, uh, he used to produce for Vice, he finds a way to make it funny and important. So hang on for that one. But we're going to have a little dance party commercial break right now. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.